Uh, but basically, this rule would require companies to make more disclosures about their climate change risks. Now, for anybody who was thinking, wasn't the SEC going to make more disclosures about ESG risks generally? Once upon a time, that was the thinking. This is Tom Fox. Welcome to Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast where, with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, we take a deep dive into a compliance topic. In this episode, Matt and I take a deep dive into the proposed SEC rules, which were released Monday on climate change and corporate responsibility for reporting on climate change at various stages in a corporation's business relationships and its size. It's something every compliance professional will need to be aware of. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. First of all, welcome back, Matt. Hello, Tom. It's good to be here today. So, Matt, we finally had the release of the Security and Exchange Commission's long-awaited proposal for the disclosure of risks related to climate change. Uh, Could you lead us up to what led to today and then what you saw in the release from today? Yeah, sure, Tom. So this was a rule that the SEC has talked about for a long time. And they finally adopted it today. It was on a 3-1 vote with the Republican commissioner who voted against it. That is not a surprise. Uh, But basically, this rule would require companies to make more disclosures about their climate change risks. Now, for anybody who was thinking, wasn't the SEC going to make more disclosures about ESG risks generally? Once upon a time, that was the thinking. That is not what this was about. This is about climate change risks only. So what happened to the S and the G and the other E risks that are environmental but not climate change? I I don't know. But uh, the plan would be that starting by about two years from now, companies would need to start making many more disclosures about their greenhouse gas emissions and their basic approach to climate risks overall and what sort of climate risks they have. Um, So in theory, these proposed rules would get adopted in final form later this year. Uh, Then you would have one year, 2023, of gathering all of that data, and then large companies start putting it in their reports in 2024, and smaller companies would start doing it in 2025 and 26 and there on out. But that's what it is at a high level here. We finally have some insight into disclosing greenhouse gas emissions, various other climate risks. You have about a year, two years to get your head around this and get rolling if you're a large company. And that's what's coming. Matt, one of the things that interested me was that in addition to some specific disclosures the SEC required, it has a, a not a formula, but a form for what they call scopes. So scope one, scope two, scope three. Could you explain to the audience what each scope is and the significance, if any, you find in the three scopes that are now required for reporting? Yeah, this is going to be a key part of what you'd have to disclose. So scope one emissions are greenhouse gas emissions, your business emits personally, the stuff that comes out of the smokestacks or the chimneys or anything like that. Scope two would be, in addition, what greenhouse gas emissions you make because of the electricity you buy or the heat or the coolant or anything else. So all of that energy that you're purchasing, the power plants are making greenhouse gas emissions to give you that energy. So what is that amount? So that's scope two. And then scope three would be all the other greenhouse gas emissions that are created from your supply chain. So if you're buying components from somebody, what are their greenhouse gas emissions? If you are selling something that is going to make a lot of greenhouse gas emissions when your customers use the product, what are those emissions? You total it all up for scope three. This gets interesting because all businesses would need to disclose scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. Large companies would also, in a year or two later, need to start including their scope three emissions. Smaller companies would not. They would be exempt from this rule. And uh, you also have an 
attestation requirement for all of this. So eventually, companies will need to get an audit firm or some sort of ESG consulting firm to attest to the accuracy of these greenhouse gas emission disclosures you make. You will have to audit, if you're a large company, scope one and two, but not scope three. And then smaller companies would never need to uh, either report or audit scope three emissions because the general thinking is that's going to be too hard for smaller businesses to be able to figure out. But you will need to pay attention to a lot of that. Um, There is a framework out there called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which defines scope one, two, and three and offers ways to help you figure it out, what you're going to put in your reports and how you would calculate all these numbers. So that's going to be a big part of the disclosure is just simply figuring out what are the greenhouse gas emissions we're making. I have other stuff to say about other climate risks, but let's be clear that a big chunk of what you're going to have to worry about are greenhouse gas emissions and how you calculate all of that correctly. Matt, you've already blogged about these new proposed rules on radical compliance. And one of the things you said in your blog post was you found that or feel that One of the drivers for the SEC was consistency in disclosure. What did you mean by consistency in disclosure? Well, this is what the Democrats who are on the commission, that was one of their big rationales for pushing this proposal through, uh, is that there is already a rule on the books at the SEC that companies must disclose material climate change risks. That's been around since 2010, but that is a principle-based rule So companies have a lot of discretion in what they're going to decide as material risk and how they're going to report it. Uh, If you're a Republican commission, you like that sort of a thing. If you are a Democratic commission, you were looking for more clarity. And the other point that Democrats were bringing up is that in the intervening 12 years, lots of companies have started disclosing a lot about their climate risks. But If everything is so principles based, that doesn't leave investors with an easy way to compare one set of risks to another from one company to the next. And that's what their legal basis and their rationale for saying, let's put more structure around what we want to do here for disclosure of climate risks. Um, Let's quantify it. Let's make it a number. Greenhouse gas emissions. You can put that in there. It's a total probably in cubic tons or something like that. But Uh, They're looking for ways to enhance the comparability of these disclosures from one company to the next and to make sure that it's consistent year over year over year. Thinking being that if investors have an easier time of digesting all of this information, they can make better decisions about where they want to put their money and then happiness ensues. That at least is the argument in favor of these uh, using these um, climate change risks or using SEC rules to justify climate change disclosures. In your blog, you also posed a series of questions uh, that were either not answered by today's announcement or questions after you reading it, uh, you, you posed. So I was wondering if you could go through some of the questions, starting with uh, whether or not greenhouse gas emission disclosures would be subject to internal controls and what did it raise for you? Yeah, so th- that is how compliance officers and risk managers right now, how should you be thinking about this? Uh, there's a couple of big questions that you we don't have answers for yet, but you might want to ponder. And we should remember that right now, these are proposed rules. They're open for public comment for, I believe, 60 days. And the SEC would love people to comment on them. Uh, but you know, there aren't necessarily clear answers. And depending on the comments, conceivably, the SEC might change what the final rule will actually look like. But here are some of the questions that some of the commissioners raised or that I'm wondering about. It's number one, these greenhouse gas disclosures, would they be subject to some set of internal controls or not? Right now, no, they're not. Right now, they would be filed as part of Regulation SK. So those are the qualitative disclosures that you make in the 10Q or the 10K, things like material risks in the management discussion and analysis or risk factors in the business description or something like that. But that's very different than the quantitative disclosures you make under Reg SX. And that's the numbers. That's the line items for real financial performance stuff. Now, 
under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, under Regulation SX, uh, then those quanti- quantitative disclosures are subject to internal controls. You have internal control over financial reporting to assure the accuracy of these numerical disclosures that you're making about financial data. So Alison Heron Lee, one of the Democratic commissioners, and she's a big voice in favor of climate change disclosure, she said, is this really the right way to treat greenhouse gas emissions that they're not going to have any internal controls? So would they be moved from the proposed Reg Reg SK disclosures into Reg SX disclosures where suddenly they are quantitative and there should therefore be some sort of internal control over greenhouse gas disclosures. Um, would they be ICFR controls? I'm not quite sure how that would work. Neither did Commissioner Lee. She also speculated, would there be something like internal control over climate reporting, which I guess is a thing, but I've never really stopped to think about what would that actually look like. So that's question number one, is how do we treat internal controls to gain assurance over uh, these greenhouse gas disclosures? Question two, What about all these attestations and audit requirements and whatnot? So as proposed right now, a company would need to get an attestation, which is one stop short of a formal audit, but it's pretty close to an audit. Um, Larger companies would need to get this done. And you would have one year at the first year of compliance with limited attestation and assurance, which basically means the assuring firm is going to say, well, we didn't find anything materially wrong, so looks okay. But that is not the same as reasonable assurance, which would kick in after year two and then a year from there forward, where you, you, the audit firm, the assessor, you'd have to definitively and affirmatively say, we looked into this. We believe that these disclosures are material correct in all uh, material aspects. Um, So is that the right way to handle it? Should there be limited assurance forever? Should we not have limited assurance at all? Should smaller reporting companies get some sort of additional break on assurance? Should they not? Another question is, who are these assurance firms who are going to do this? Uh, The big four audit firms and other big accounting firms, they're going to be happy to do it for an hourly fee, which I'm sure will be outrageous. But they've been planning for this. But it isn't restricted to CPAs and CPA audit firms, you could have some sort of ESG advisory firm that would wind up providing attestations and assurance over your greenhouse gas disclosures. Uh, We're not quite sure on how that will work. Are there enough firms out there that can do this? How do we know that they're going to be competent? Um, What about if you want to dump one assurance firm in favor of another? In the auditing world, if you switch up auditors, that's a big deal. Well, would it be a big deal here? We don't know. And so that's going to be another question that people involved in assuring and disclosing these risks, you're going to have to think about this. And then the last question that I had was more about the transition plans that companies might disclose. So the SEC rule, as proposed right now, does not say you must have a plan to transition to a net zero future. I don't think the SEC would have any legal basis to require that. But if you, company, do say that you're going to transition to a net zero future, then, under the proposed rule, then yes, you are going to have to explain what is that plan, how are you measuring your progress on that plan, uh, when do you expect to achieve this plan. Like You're going to have to flesh that out. So my question would be, these net zero transition promises sound an awful lot like the nice, gauzy, feel-good stuff in a corporate sustainability report. We already know, we have already seen the SEC staff starting to send comment letters to companies. Well, you said this nice stuff about climate risks in your sustainability report, but you didn't mention it in the actual 10Q. Why not? So, Are we going to maybe see a world where you're going to have to take those promises in the sustainability report much more seriously because you're going to have to explain how you're going to get there? Or will companies retreat from making these gauzy promises in the sustainability report and just keep it tight and factually based in the 10Q and the 10K and that's going to be it? Um, 
we don't know. But that's going to be another question of mine is how do we cross over from the nice stuff and sustainability report to the really practical, uh, you know, potentially legally liable issues that get disclosed in the Q or the K? And we're going to have to think about that, too. We're going to have a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back with more Compliance Into the Weeds. Matt, uh, you've been following uh, this topic for quite some time. Do you anticipate a large amount, medium amount of pushback from uh, the corporate world, or is it more just resignation that uh, this has been coming, at least under this administration, and at least we have something that can guide us now? I think that you're going to see, I think you'll see a huge amount of comment, both for and against. Now, specifically, Will large companies be pushing against this? That's a tricky question because it's not a good look to put out a nice, gauzy sustainability report or be involved in the business roundtable where you're talking about the importance of stakeholder capitalism, and yet you come out swinging against climate change disclosures. Um, That's going to be tricky for large companies. So I would not be surprised if they privately are not thrilled with this but are going to leave others to do their dirty work of commenting to the SEC, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or um, Republicans in the House Financial Services Committee are already incensed over this. They have been for quite some time. Now they are more officially incensed, and that will only go up. Um, Plus, there's actually always going to be the very valid question of who's going to sue the SEC over this. I will die of a heart attack if there is not a lawsuit over this. Um, Commissioner Hester Pierce has already said that uh, when she was reading out her statement and opposing these rules, that she thought there was not much of a legal basis for the SEC to go down this road. Big red flag to all the conservative activists out there. Somebody somewhere, please sue us once we adopt these rules. I am fully certain that will happen. What's going to happen to it in federal court? Who knows? That depends on the judge and the arguments and whatnot. But um, I do think companies, larger companies, they're going to have to do a bit of deft footwork to communicate their displeasure over this without looking like, um, you know, climate change deniers or boogeymen that's just going to do nothing except irritate the investors who are in favor of more climate change disclosures. Uh, So there's going to be a lot of that that's going on. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get to visit uh, this topic again. I suspect we will visit it many, many times in the future, Tom. Thank you. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. We're going to link to Matt's blog post in the show notes, so check that out for additional information. You can reach Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. You can reach me, Tom Fox, at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Hope you will plan to join Matt and I again next week where we take up another topic going into the weeds in Compliance Into the Weeds. And finally, Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. And we'd appreciate it if you would leave us a review on iTunes as it would help get the word out about this most unique podcast. Thanks again, and we look forward to visiting with you again. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.